morning. Uh, I'm Hales Van Jury. <coughs> Welcome to today's uh, meeting on uh, the Arab awakening is democracy and mirage. Could I, uh, before I start, could I ask everybody please to close their cell phones, Blackberry, no texting please because I'm told it interferes with the live webcast we have. And we have people both in the United States, in Europe and, uh, and in the region watching it. So please um, just manage for two hours without checking your uh, messages. Thank you. Uh, today's meeting, uh, the Arab awakening is a democracy a mirage. Um, according to my colleague Dan Bromberg, couldn't be more timely when we uh, started this, the idea of um, having this meeting, it, we were all uh, much more hopeful that the development in the region will move towards the aspiration of the people who came out in uh, Tunisia to <coughs> demonstrate and ask for a change of uh, regime. Same thing in Egypt, Libya, Yemen, um, in a way in Bahrain. Um, we have had uh, minor, smaller demonstrations in uh, uh, Morocco. We have had elections in uh, Algeria. Um, we are watching carefully Jordan and of course Syria, which is unbelievable. But I think if we look back and see how the how politics have developed in these countries, it necessarily is not moving towards a quick and swift democratic uh, change. In Egypt, um, the military, the SCAF, is consolidating its power more and more. I mean, through in a way, whatever constitution they believe it exists through constitutional mean, the constitutional court decided to dissolve the parliament, SCAF decided to give themselves more power. Uh, if you look at Tunisia, yes, they had a free elections for, the, for an assembly to draft the constitution but they have horrendous economic problem, plus also this, the recent developments between uh, the, the fights between the Salafis and the Nahda and the secularists. And last week, uh, curfew was imposed on eight Tunisian cities, including Tunis. Um, Yemen is a different story, so is uh, Libya. So the question is really, yes, we should be all hopeful that democracy will make its way in the region. But yes, we also know it's a process. But how long is this process going to take? And what do we need to expedite this uh, process? So we have today with us four uh, top experts in the field. So um, we will start with uh, Roberto Toscano, who is currently the president of the Intercultural Foundation in Italy. He served in the Italian Foreign Ministry, was the ambassador uh, to the Italian ambassador to Iran 
and to India, and he's a former Wilson Center Public Policy uh, Fellow. Followed by Mushira Khattab, who is currently a public policy scholar at the Wilson Center. She is also a visiting professor on gender issues and human rights at Perugia University in Italy. And she is the former uh, Minister of Family and Population of Egypt, as well as Assistant Minister of Foreign Affairs. She served as Egypt's ambassador to South Africa when Nelson Mandela was there, and to the Czech Republic when Vaclav Havel was there. So she is one of those most fortunate people who met to uh, very important people of our century, Mandela and uh, Havel. Uh, Fatma Speti Kasim, to my left, is the former director of the UN Center for Women, Economic and Social Commission of Western Asia, ESQUA. Uh, <coughs> she served in Baghdad, Amman, and Beirut and she's a freelance consultant on gender and women's issues in the Arab countries. Our cooperation goes back to 2003 when we co-sponsored meeting at uh, uh, ESQUA in um, Beirut. She also, uh, she has been working, or we have been working with her on conferences as recent as uh, two weeks ago in Amman, bringing a group of Middle Eastern pa women parliamentarian for a two-day workshop organized by Iraq Foundation. Finally, to my extreme left is Daniel Bromberg. He's the co-director of Democracy and Governance Studies at Georgetown University and senior advisor to the Center for Conflict Management at the United States Institute of Peace, where he focuses on democratization and reform in the Middle East and the wider Islamic uh, world. My, I told the speakers they each can have, uh, will have 15 minutes and not a minute longer. I really will use the prerogative of the chair to cut them off. And they can either speak from uh, the chair here, or if they prefer, they can go to the podium. It is their decision. This is a conversational style uh, meeting, and uh, we will open up the floor to you in the after their presentation and discussion between them. Roberto, you have the floor. Thank you. Well, I don't think to go back to what uh, Hale said by uh, going around the area and see what happened. I mean, last year we were here, actually here, with a lot of optimism, and then something happened. Uh, it's different in every country, but probably what's happening now raises some very important and fundamental questions on democracy as such, even beyond the area. So I'd like to focus on that type of uh, uh, analysis. Um, I found a quote that's rather interesting in an article that was published in September of last year. It says, on February the 11th, uh, when Mubarak stepped down, February 11th was the culmination of the Arab Revolution. On February 12th, the counter-revolution counter started. It is true in many, many ways. So uh, do we have to say it was a false start? <coughs> Nothing happened and that things will go back to where they were? No. Actually, when I'm looking for a, a historical parallel, what comes to my mind is 1848. In 1848 in Europe, everybody got very excited. It seemed that a revolution was going to win all over in every country, and, but it was repressed. And the Ancien Regime uh, came back with a vengeance. And yet, 1848 was the beginning of a process that then uh, led to constitutional government, to national uh, independence uh, versus the empires, and so on and so forth. So, when I'm very optimistic, I think this is in 1848. <coughs> but 
But uh, what are the problems? What are the problems that have emerged? First of all, in order to have the democracy, you need the citizens. Democracy needs a demos. But what have we seen until now? Until now, we saw with the traditional dictatorships, um, a dictator, cronies on one side, and subjects on the other. There were no citizens. So what's happening now? If you, there is a contradiction in terms imagining a sectarian democracy. Because a sectarian democracy doesn't identify a demos. It identifies an ethnos that can be racial, but can also be religious. If you identify the quality of, oops, it dropped. <laughs> if you uh, give full citizenship to somebody belonging to a race or to a religion, and everybody else is maybe tolerated, uh, this is not democracy. Is the problem religion? Well, I'm not so sure. In the sense that religion, uh, what you see is not a, uh, let's say, a, a, a return of great religious faith, but religion has been identified as a reference for identity and for political activity. So religion is important, but as a political uh, tool. <coughs> Now, in the West, uh, uh, political modernization and democracy came about in parallel with what we call secularism, meaning the separation of church and state. Why isn't it happening in the Middle East? Well, first of all, even Christianity wasn't born democratic and pluralistic. Okay, let's face it. It took the Protestant Reformation. It took the growth of the... Uh, uh, strong nation state, and then eventually uh, religion accommodated itself with democracy, but it wasn't born democratic. But what's happening? Uh, why isn't secularism uh, even getting stronger in the um, uh, Middle East, except for some minorities? And we know they are minorities. They, we have seen recently that secular people are not the majority in Egypt or uh, elsewhere. Well, first of all, uh, secularism was perceived as a foreign invention. You know, Napoleon gets to Egypt and uh, liberté, égalité, fraternité, and, uh, and that's not something that was perceived as their own. This is one part. <coughs> the second part is that uh, secularists in uh, the Middle East, they, they have existed, but they love secularism more than democracy. I'm talking about Ataturk, I'm talking about Reza Shah. They were anti-democratic secularist. So the two things don't go hand in hand. Um, of course, you can be a citizen and a believer at the same time. But you're not a citizen insofar you're a believer. And this is the concept of secularism that is not uh, being perceived. Uh, uh, it's also a cultural problem. You know. Once I read that when uh, somebody had to translate uh, uh, laic into Arabic, they used la dini, which means non-religious. If you say non-religious, game over. In Europe, people are laic and believers. It's, there is no problem. Mm -hmm. You can be a secular believer and a secular non-believer. This concept, which it, to us, uh, at least to us in Europe or in this country, is uh, self-evident. It's not self-evident in the Arab countries. Mm. If you're laic, it's, it's a soft way of saying you're atheist. That's the way it's being perceived. If we don't break that, it's going to be very difficult to uh, have a real, secular, democratic system in a country where most people are believers. Second problem, democracy and the rule of law. It is true that uh, democracy uh, is not a universal reality, but it is a universal aspiration. But I think in the West we made a, a mistake. Uh, we forgot our own history. We pretend we were born democratic. You know, in, in some text, when, you, when we talk about democracy, we say the first democratic document is the Magna Carta of 1215. It was a pact. 
between a sovereign and warlords was not democracy, but it was the beginning of some rules. So historically, we became democratic after centuries of rules that were, were not democratic. They were oligarchic or monarchic, or, but the rules came before democracy. I mean, 19th century England was not a democracy. 5% of the people uh, had uh, the right to decide about the common uh, 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 policies and, and, and the way the state was uh, uh, run. And then we see what happens when we start with democracy before the rule of law. Shall we mention Afghanistan? We have elections, even free and fair elections, let's say. Let's imagine we can have them. In a country where there is no rule of law, is a fraud. It's a total fraud. So we tend to forget that. Another point, democracy and civil society. Well, traditionally, uh, given the fact of uh, horrifying dictatorships uh, oppressing society, we have tended in the West to identify the possibility of democracy in civil society, not in the state, against the state, with dissidents, with uh, uh, movements, which maybe explains why we uh, didn't understand really what was going on. This is not only the problem of the Middle East. You know, I live in Spain now, and when the uh, streets and, and, and squares of Spain were filled by the indignados, the indignant ones, people say, hey, something is happening here. Well, nothing happened. Because society can be very active, can be very, uh, uh, very much uh, uh, in, in contradiction with the state and against, uh, um, against the political class which is not reflecting the needs of the people and so on and so forth. But if you don't translate that into politics, meaning real leaders, platforms, strategies, uh, I'm afraid nothing will happen. Um, a quote here by Thomas Friedman. Talk about the Egypt's incredible brave Facebook generation rebels, he wrote recently, they could organize protests and demonstrations and act with often reckless courage to challenge the old regime, but they could not go on to rally around a single candidate and then engage in a slow, dull, grinding work of organizing a political party that could contest an election district by district. So. Uh, Without civil society, politics is the purview of a non-democratic elite. But without the political level, the state level, you don't go very far, unfortunately. But it's not only a question of organization, as a matter of fact. Why are radical Islamists popular? Because of the Quran? No, no, no. Because they are perceived as not being corrupt, because they are present in society, because they have schools, because they have uh, you know, welfare institutions. That is extremely important. And I'm afraid that people whom we like, I mean the liberal Democrats, have not been so attentive to those needs. The real thing is to prove that democracy and c material conditions go hand in hand. But if you put them in alternative, people will tend to follow other uh, leaders and other political formulas. Uh, and why are the military in Egypt uh, capable of getting not the majority of votes, but a lot of votes? Very simple. People want security. People are more afraid of chaos than of poverty because they know that chaos is is not sustainable, is not sustainable on a daily basis. So in a situation of chaos, which of course can be um, also produced, people turn to those who can guarantee stability. Guess who? The military usually. Last point. We might agree that today democracy is an unbeatable brand name. It's not the end of history, but definitely even dictators these days say that they are democratic. So on a rhetorical and ideological level, 
There is no more discussion. Long live democracy. But uh, what we're seeing is the spread of something which is a contradiction in terms, uh, authoritarian democracy, or even better, I found a, a, a Russian sociologist when uh, he was describing Putin and his political system, he used the expression imitation democracy. <laughs> I found it very interesting because all the trappings are there, the elections are there, political parties are there, the newspapers are there, but it's imitation because there is under that level, there is authoritarianism, which it turns itself into repression when it's needed, but a lot of populism, demagoguery, you know, you can have very many ways of circumventing the substance of democracy. And then there is the opposite uh, uh, danger. Of course, democracy is the rule of the majority, but it's not only the rule of the majority. Majority rule without the constitutional provisions for the defense of uh, minorities is not what we understand as democracy. The uh, Greeks, uh, 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 Aristotelists, talked about democracy and something that he called oclocracy, mob rule. You can win a plebiscite and not be democratic. After all, Adolf Hitler won a plebiscite in 1933. Um, so at the end, We have to come to the conclusion that uh, there is another problem. Uh, we have had a tendency to imagine that there is one type of democracy that can be applied everywhere. Uh, I prefer to quote uh, Tolstoy. In Anna Karenina, he said, all happy families are the same, all unhappy families are unhappy in their own way. As far as democracy goes, it's the opposite. All democracies are democratic in their own way. All non-democracies tend to resemble each other so much. Look, I lived in Pinochet's Chile, in the Soviet Union under communism, and in, in, in Tehran under the, you know, the Ayatollahs. You, the parallels, even aesthetic, I mean, political police and this and that. I remember once showing in my embassy The Life of Others, the German uh, film on the Stasi. And my Iranian friends, when the lights went on, looked at the screen and said, ha, huh, you know, recognizing something that was their own. I mean, there is nothing in common between East German communism and, and uh, uh, Iranian Islamic Republic. And yet there is a lot in common. So democracies are uh, should be uh, mentioned in the plural. Finally, let's try to uh, answer the question that's in the title. Is democracy a mirage? Now, if we mean that it's uh, uh, a figment of the imagination, no, it's not a figment of the imagination. Democracy exists, uh, fortunately. But maybe it's really a mirage in the material sense, because a mirage is not a hallucination. A mirage is an optical distortion that makes you see things that are real closer than they really are. <coughs> you see the oasis there, but it's not near. It's very, very far. So probably there are still many miles of harsh and dangerous desert to cross before getting to the oasis. But it's, uh, it's worth continuing, and it's, uh, although it's very difficult, uh, the oasis exists. And this is the only consolation we can draw. Thank you. Thank you. Great metaphor. Mm -hmm. Here is the Buddha. Oh, okay. Thank you. <coughs> Good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you very much, Hale, for organizing this. And I think uh, everybody now uh, <coughs> around the world is looking at Egypt and the uh, Tahrir Square, which is uh, completely packed as we speak in spite of the scorching heat. Uh, the uh, 25th uh, January 2011 revolution that uh, inspired the world, as President Obama has said, has turned into a roller coaster ride. And uh, as a consequence, Egypt is going through a very rough 
testing time. But if I am going to give you the end uh, conclusion of my uh, intervention ahead of time, democracy for Egypt is not a mirage, and democracy is in the making. Democracy is not a destination, it is a process. It's a culture. Uh, Robert, you said on the 11th there was a revolution, 11th of January 2011, 25th of January, sorry, 2011, there was a revolution, and then on the uh, 12th uh, of, uh, of February, there was uh, 11th of February and 12th of February, February the counter-revolution. Uh, well, uh, you don't expect uh, uh, today we have a revolution, tomorrow we have a new order. It never happens. It never happens. It's a process. It's a fight. Everyone wants to win and gain. And if it doesn't happen like this, then something is definitely wrong. And when we look at a country with the size and magnitude of Egypt by the virtue of the masses, the, the complexion of the people, the history, the international relations, it had to be complicated. The transition had to be complicated. And really, I would like to uh, take you back uh, if, if democracy is a journey, I would like to take you back and have a quick look at the uh, position of the main players uh, right now in Egypt. Uh, SCAF, like Hala said in the introduction, the political Islam, be it the Muslim Brotherhood or the Salafis and the other Islamic parties, I know that there are different nuances. Uh, between each and every one of them, but at the end of the day, they are all political Islam and they all use religion as a tool for, for uh, propaganda uh, or for advocacy to be uh, neutral. And then the revolutionaries, the liberals, and the masses, if you can really separate the masses from these three or four categories. Uh, now, in Egypt, Egyptians are holding or were holding their breath for the final results of the presidential elections. Yet they are down in Tahrir Square not because of the results of the election, despite the fact that each uh, contender or each candidate claims victory. Official results are not out yet. But the people are not in Tahrir Square because of the presidential elections. They are in Tahrir Square because of the foundation of the democratic process. They are in Tahrir Square because of a constitutional declaration, an additional one that was issued two days ago. And they are in Tahrir Square protesting yet demanding exactly what it is about this constitutional declaration. So if I can uh, uh, take you uh, back and have a look at what's happening now, we can say that uh, when people took to Tahrir Square, they were all for a seemingly unattainable goal, which is the fall of Mubarak. When they attained this goal, there was some sort of daze. And up till now, Egypt, with all the actors that I have mentioned, are trying to figure out Egypt without Mubarak. And this is the journey to democracy. There has been many articles written uh, recently, especially yesterday and the day before yesterday, about the dangerous situation in Egypt, the collapse of the political system in Egypt, and, and, and all of this. I know it's worrying, but it's not really uh, unexpected. And uh, though it looks alarming, it carries many positive results or many positive uh, prospects for the future of Egypt. Uh, Many articles spoke about constitutional disarray. Egypt is living now in constitutional disarray. Why? 
in uh, the Mubarak step down uh, 11th of February and then in March SCAF uh, formed uh, a committee to amend articles, certain articles of the frozen 1971 constitution because the constitution was frozen. Yet they appointed a committee to amend articles of the frozen <coughs> constitution. So this was a question <coughs> mark. The amendments were made by the committee appointed by SCAF and then to acquire legitimacy for this amendments, it was put in totality uh, for a referendum. So people were asked to say yes or no on the totality. The result was yes, and then people found or read or were informed that there is a constitutional declaration of 62 or 63 articles that went beyond the articles that they have casted their votes on. This constitutional declaration set the rules for the parliamentary election, for the presidential election, for the uh, mandate of the constitutional committee that is supposed to rewrite Egypt's constitution. So there are certain question marks, what, will the what uh, did the people vote on, what was done without consulting the people, and is this democracy or not? Parliamentary elections took place and people from all over the world observed the elections and they said the elections were fair and free. Though I question fair because of the manipulation of religion or religion was used to manipulate the voters. Anyway, uh, the elections, the parliamentary elections gave the uh, is political Islam a sweeping majority about 74 to 80 percent. Despite all of this, people were happy with the results of the parliamentary elections and they accepted it. Yet from day one, the law governing political rights, which formed the basis for the parliamentary elections, were disputed. The constitutionality of this law was disputed because uh, you had two-thirds for party and one-third for individual, and you allowed the parties to run for the individual. So this has usurped the right of those outside parties to have a place in the parliament. And actually, this unfairness or this injustice has helped the Muslim Brotherhood and the political Islam, and people were very angry and they accused SCAF of handing over the parliament on a gold platter to uh, the political Islam, yet they accepted it. It's very interesting to see the reaction of the people after the parliamentary elections and how they said, fine, we are going to work together, and the liberals and everybody accepted the results. And to compare this re uh, uh, reaction with the ruling of the Supreme Constitutional Court uh, three or four days ago when it ruled the, this law on political rights unconstitutional. The, the reaction of the majority of the people was a sigh of relief that this parliament will be resolved. Why? And this is the journey to democracy. This the, the reason is to be found in the attitude of Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafis in the uh, parliament. Uh, parliament sessions were all aired live on television and people could just turn it on and watch. And at the beginning of the uh, mandate of the parliament, you could see people glued to television in cafes, at homes, everywhere people were just watching their representatives that they have chosen. And what have they found? They have found 
people who are very arrogant, they have found debate that does not reflect the needs of the people who took off to the streets on the 25th of January. Uh, they found a focus on pity issues. They did not find any attention given to the issues of unemployment, the issues of poverty, corruption. The, 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 the revolution carried the banner to fight corruption. How do you fight corruption? You have to look at the laws that those corrupt use to be corrupted and let them get away with it. None of this was discussed. Education, which lies at the heart of the unemployment of the youth, the biggest segment of the population and the biggest segment in the unemployed group of the society, nothing of this was discussed. Egypt needs reform, and actually Thomas Friedman wrote an article uh, on the 18th of January, uh, on the 18th of June, talking about rot learning and uh, the need to reform the education. And he really described the situation <coughs> very accurately, that a, a graduate from the university finds himself or herself without any skill that makes him or her uh, uh, competitive in the labor market. So the parliament did not discuss any of this. They gave priority to uh, uh, abolishing women's rights. Uh, they gave priorities to uh, banning certain toys. Uh, they gave priorities to uh, a, a, a man having sex with his dead wife after uh, six hours after she died. So the people really saw that this parliament does not <coughs> meet <coughs> their expectation. So when the Constitutional Court ruled the, 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 that the Parliament must be dissolved, there was a sigh of relief. So the uh, political Islam is falling out of favor. They are losing, and you can compare the number of votes they got in the parliamentary elections with the number of votes they got in the presidential elections. And right now, it's a very tight race, very tight race. And again, a big uh, achievement of the democratic journey in Egypt is that Egyptians have been having four elections so far, none of which was rigged. There were irregularities, and it's reported, and it's before the court. So this is really a big achievement. Now, the third group is the liberals. And I agree with part of what you have said. The liberals have not presented themselves properly to the population. They have not infiltrated well like the Muslim Brotherhood who have been organizing themselves very well. And uh, let's not forget that the parliamentary election happened so quickly before the liberals could organize themselves. and. <coughs> the Muslim Brotherhood were the most organized groups, and they had a mechanism well in place. They have abundant financial resources, and they had the mosques. The mosques, they were working from the mosques, and they had a free ride. So despite that, the liberals could impose or, or could make their presence or their words heard. Uh, they were able to abort the formation of the Constitutional Assembly, which again was not representative of the revolution. Actually, if you look at the political map now and the distribution of power, you don't find the people who prepared and led the revolution and made the revolution <coughs> happen. Because uh, the, the critical first days of the revolution Muslim Brotherhood were not there, the Salafis <coughs> were not there, and these were the most critical days. So the, the revolutionaries feel that they, w w their work has been usurped. So if I can quickly turn to the, the, the third, okay, the people. I think the people are the strongest power player so far. 
And I really think uh, what Rami Khoury, uh, you sent me an article by Rami Khoury two days ago. Uh, he, he spoke about Tahrir Square and the youth in Tahrir Square and the masses. And he said, despite all of this, Egypt will come out right. And I think it will come out right. The Egyptian masses have uh, transformed Tahrir Square from a traffic uh, hub into a place uh, of uh, freedom of expression. Their voices are not only heard, but heeded. The Constitutional Assembly is formed now. It, they appointed a head, and we are still hopeful for a constitution like that of South Africa. I think the experience of South Africa is very telling. Not any other experience, because I read some articles trying to say those can give Egyptians a lesson. No. With due respect, I feel the South Africans and, and, and the South Africans have done it the way they fought for their freedom, the way they handled the post new democratic dispensation, the dialogue, the societal d dialogue and debate around the constitution, how their constitution was formed, how men and women took equal shares in forming the new government. So South Africa is an example. The Constitution of South Africa, the rights of women in the Constitution of South Africa, the rights of children in the Constitution of South Africa. No democracy without equal rights for women, without equal rights for children. And all <coughs> these are political priorities. It's not social issues that can wait for later. So. I am very, very, very optimistic about the future of Egypt. And I think the people of Egypt who have a very big um, bulk of intellectuals, uh, really they will insist on uh, getting the, uh, the objectives that the uh, revolutionaries asked for, uh, social uh, justice, dignity, and freedom. They will get it. It will take time. They need the world to support them, but they don't need any interference in their affairs. And I am very positive that they will get it right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Um, uh, talking about intellectual in Egypt on the um, 26th, we are having the director, the president of the Alexandria Library, yes. Mr. Sarajuddin, speaking about the Arab Spring from the point of view of Alexandria. You know. So I will invite all of you, please, to come and listen to him. Fatima, you have it. You want to go yeah, to the podium? Yeah, yeah. I'll follow you. I'll give you a five-minute warning, and then that's I okay. am aware of your warnings. <laughs> 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 that, uh, that's I'm why I'm running away. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, I don't want to repeat what uh, my uh, panelist uh, colleagues have said, but I'm honored to address such a uh, distinguished audience and would like to thank Harry for inviting me to speak on this very important topic. It's indeed, it's on the minds and thoughts of all Arabs, uh, Arab activists, and the global community at large. As always, Hale rema uh, remains on top of events. First, I will cite few facts and realities of the post-2011 uh, uh, Arab awakening, I like to call it, because we don't know in which season we are to call it an Arab Spring. Um, I think this is more appropriate. It's an Arab awakening. Then I will respond to the main question that uh, is posed to the panel, is uh, Arab democracy a mirage, by addressing two issues. One, is Islam incompatible with democracy? And two, is there any Arab exceptionalism at the root of the problems? that we are facing, the democratic deficits. And we'll conclude by flagging a few challenges. At the outset, I wish to clarify our understanding of what is democracy or democratia. Literally, it means rule by the people. 
democracy is a process, as my colleagues have said, and it's not an end by itself. It reshapes and restructures itself to allow for the provision of the common good uh, to all citizens on equal footing. Democratic practices adapt continuously to emerging and imminent interests of individuals, institutions, societies, and polities in order to ensure economic gro growth, political equality, distributive justice, and human and national development. As scholars have mentioned, there is a link between democracy and development, as my colleague Roberto has said, and that economic development does not necessarily lead to democracy, but it may sustain it. Democracy is pre premised on principles of freedom of choice, expression, association, equal citizenship, inclusion. Even the Greeks have excluded women and slaves, the Greeks, the, the forefathers of, of uh, democracy. And what is more interesting is that an anti-democratic Plato questioned this practice. It's also premised on free and fair elections, peaceful transition to authority, right of contestation, separation of powers, and all the principles of accountability and uh, transparency. In a democracy, political inequalities among citizens are reduced to a minimum and in terms of capacities and opportunities, so that effective participation is ensured via equitable distribution of economic resources, positions, opportunities, knowledge, information, and cognitive skills. Democratic practices are not uniform across consolidated democracies. It's practiced differently in different countries with respect to a host of C's, which I call C's with a capital C. Choice, consensus, conflict management, communication, competition, consultation, citizenship, and courts, as in judiciary. The reality is that representative democracy and full equality remains elusive to our date. It's untenable in many so-called fledgling and consolidated democracies. There's no perfect model of democracy. What are the facts and realities in the Arab world? Uh, in the first Arab Human Development Report published in 1991 by UNDP, the United Nations Development Program, it highlighted three main deficits in the Arab world. Freedom, knowledge, and women's empowerment. So the Arab awakening should not come as a surprise to us. We have been alerted, but human beings have short and selective memories. The Arab activists, young and old, they did not, they, they in the freedom squares, they called for freedom, dignity, political equality, and social justice. They did not call for Islamization of the countries. They did not call for gender equality. They were calling for dignity. Dignity, that's what they were calling for. These popular social movements and revolts proceeded without planning, organization, and designated leadership. Further, I'm talking about the, uh, the third actors, the, the, the masses, the liberals the activists, what, what I call the activists. The uprisings were not guided by any ideals or ideology, or they did not have any political platforms. In contrast to those witnessed two centuries ago uh, in the European Union uh, Renaissance. And maybe this is why this left a vacuum for Islamists to step in. But this is besides the point now, they are there. A number of the Arab countries, like in Libya, did not maintain any public institutions, and this is a major problem. In principle, long-standing institutions are essential to protect against chaos and ensure peaceful transition without risking counter-revolutions or the breakdown of the process of the democratic transition. In the wake of this watershed, one can only admit that the current situation in the Arab region is foggy at best, with a huge overcast which prevents any clear prediction on what the future holds. Nevertheless, let's take stock of what happened. One, there are three important realities. The transition in the Arab countries is irreversible. The wall of fear from despotic rulers and repressive regimes is forever broken. The voiceless are vocal. 
The toppling of this pot speaks volumes, and I argue that this raised the fears of even the other autocrats in the region. An attempt to preempt a similar fate and to show goodwill to their, and I agree, to their subjects, because they have subjects, not citizens, I refrain from using citizens by distributing, they did distribute land, funds, favors, in the true manner of what we call rentier economies or, and feudal lords. In order to force their subjects into submission, as some political observers predict, uh, predict regimes will have to, reso to resort to what we call genocide. Think Libya and Syria. Two, the second reality. The road to, the, to democracy is bumpy, thorny, winding, and long. Nevertheless, this should not and will not dissuade the people from pursuing their strives for equal rights and citizenship. The people's aspirations for change and reform will not wane. They are adamant and will continue together week after week uh, after uh, Friday prayers in the Freedom Squares. The transitional counters are now accountable to the people. Let's see, witness what's going on in Egypt and what we've heard from Mushira. I have no doubt that the activists will march to the Freedom uh, uh, March, and this I wrote before, because they did. We, we can see them there. The third reality is that the older relationship of dependence to the West, on the West, has inevitably and irreversibly changed. The activists' apprehensions of foreign intervention heightened, especially as they come to recognize and reject the more friendly relations of the West with the military institutions, think Egypt. They are more comfortable seeking homegrown, not Western-imposed initiatives. They see the West as juggling between values and interests. They call upon the West to be even-handed, especially with respect to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict and with regard to the support they continue to accord to autocrats in the Gulf. They demand from the West to practice what they preach. Th these are the three realities. Now, why is, is Islam incompatible with democracy? Huntington and many other scholars like Fox, Jonathan Fox and Stephen uh, Fish have argued that Islam is inherently undemocratic and is not compatible with democracy. They provide empirical evidence of the prevalence of democratic deficits in most of the Arab countries and some of the non-Arab Muslim majority countries. And they go ahead and say that some world religions, and we all know that, Catholicism, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Buddhism and Judaism are at least in some ways particularly hostile towards women. Fish especially maintains, and he takes this as an indicator of the uh, incompatibility of, of democracy with Islam, at the station of women li links Islam to the democratic deficits. Uh, the observed pattern is inherently discriminatory, and non-democratic practices are manifested in these countries, meaning the Arab and non-Arab Muslim countries. Uh, he argues that this is behind the substandard uh, status of women. However, the differentiation by religious family suggests that different religions have different consequences for female empowerment. Hali, stop writing. You are. <laughs> <laughs> I am minutes. going as quickly as five I can. Five minutes. <laughs> I'm sorry, five minutes. <laughs> That's it. Now, I, ha I came all the way from Beirut because I have something to give. But still, <laughs> I'm sorry, five minutes. It's all right. Don't worry. I'll, I'll stick to that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> that, that, differenti that religious families suggest that different religions have different consequences of female empowerment and leadership, and that even the influence of the same religion on women is not uniform or a constant. Now, if we look at female, because this is their argument, at female representation, you will see that the pattern is correct. But you will see that there are overachievers and underachievers among democracies. But you will see that the pattern that democracies have the highest rate of female representation in their parliament, and autocracies have the lowest. But there are overachievers and underachievers, which means that this the, the, the uh, using political regimes as an explanation does not uh, uh, calls for another explanation. Uh, the 
Arab, taking the Arab now and non-Arab uh, Muslim majority countries in comparative perspective, as a comparativist. I take the Polity 4, I don't know if you're aware of it, but this is a scale of a democracy and index, uh, like the Freedom House indices that rank countries according to their democratic level. And you look at the uh, Muslim countries, Arab and non-Arab. You see Indonesia, Senegal, uh, Turkey, Albania, uh, Bosnia, uh, Bangladesh, as well as Comoros, Djibouti, and Lebanon, for that matter, among the Arab countries. They rank high on the democracy scale, which means that these countries also have high, high levels of, of representation, which means, with this compar uh, empirical evidence, that we can conclude that I Islam is not incompatible with democracy, one. Two, Islam is no bar to gender equality. Having set this uh, aside, so is it Arab ex ex exceptionalism that puts us in this uh, uh, position? And I go back to the UNDP uh, Arab Human Report uh, uh, that claimed that there is a democratic deficit <coughs> and there's a deficit in women's empowerment. Now, some scholars like Al Stefan, they are interested in, in Islam and they fight, they say there is Arab exceptionalism. In my opinion, and I beg to disagree with my friend and mentor, uh, Al Stepan, now the reality is that with the Arab awakening, with the uprising since 2011, this is ruled out. There is no Arab exceptionalism. And using culture that is completed with, rel uh, with religion, this will change over time. This is there is nothing sui generi about uh, this argument, and there, are no, there is no despotic orientalism in the Arab world. This issue dissipated. So, two issues we've uh, set aside. What are the challenges facing, and how do we answer the, the main question? You need Democrats for democracy. We don't have Democrats. Democratic culture has to be inculcated in individuals and institutions. Our political parties are not even, they are not close in the Arab, uh, they are not close to any democracy. They're not, they're hierarchical, they're, uh, their leaders, uh, the transition uh, of leadership takes time. And, and these are, this is at the crux of the matter. And they are, even of varying religiosities, even uh, at that, they do not, they are not democratic. So this is very important <coughs> political institutions, the institutionalization. So there are five main criteria that one has to take into consideration. Leaders must not employ violent coercion to maintain their power for, for democracy to transit. Foreign intervention must be at a minimum, and there are no foreign armies on national soil. Third, a modern, dynamic, and organized pluralist society must exist, which we do not have still. A political culture and system of beliefs that's favorable to democracy must prevail. Conflictive social cleavages must be overcome. We should be tolerant. Okay, so these are the, what are the main risks? These are the challenges. What are the main risks? The risk that the military will take over, and this is the greatest and the biggest challenge. The risk of exclusion of women and minorities. This is another uh, risk. The risk of breakdown into chaos, violence, and civil conflict which we can see in many of those countries, the risk of hostile foreign intervention as we have seen in Libya, the risk of Islamists becoming the main actors, drawing the constitution in their own uh, interest and holding on to power. So there are fears that are founded, and unless, un unless we overcome them, uh, the, uh, the another, another major challenge which I should mention is how to meet the high expectations of the utopian the success of, of running, uh, uh, toppling the despots. In the short uh, term, as, as Mushira has said, this is impossible. That's why people get disappointed. Their expectations and their anticipations are for jobs and uh, overnight this will not happen. So you need to do what you <coughs> need to do. There's no magic wand. You need to be patient. It will take time, the process. You need to draw a new constitution that guarantees the, uh, their demands. And you need to adopt economic policies that will address poverty issues and jobs and, and fight corruption. W how, what are the ways to mitigate these risks? You have to have effective transitional justice mechanisms. You have to reinforce social uh, cohesion. You have to strengthen the judiciary and to ensure that in the medium term plan, 
there are there is transparent governance systems well functioning and democratization uh, of public uh, institutions the political parties are very important but they have to uh, uh, go with the norm to become more democratic i conclude with a few uh, <laughs> i conclude with a few words of caution <laughs> regional and global powers will find it more costly to challenge emerging democracies. It is not inconceivable that five to 10 years from now, a vibrant democratic culture and fully functioning democratic institutions will be firmly established. I believe in linear development, at least in Egypt and Tunisia. Tunisia is much better off than Egypt. Egypt is a doomsday scenario now, but let's wait, give it time. Uh, a stable and democratic Egypt and Tunisia might trigger Another wave of democratization in the region. The second, in the next round, there will not be no hasty fleeing despots and lifelong rulers. Regimes will either willingly reform or preempt change, or they will viciously fight back to smother the first signs of protests. Three, as Arabs reinvest themselves, their partners and supporters in the West will have to revisit their foreign affairs st strategies and policies towards a more even-handed approach vis-a-vis -vis the Arabs. This is especially needed in connection with the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. They should realize that they do not call the shots anymore. That is not it's our way or the highway. They must accept, tolerate, and reconcile with a new and reformed Arab world. Fourth, there is no Manichean dualism. That is, not all democracies are good, and not all non-democracies are bad. Countries and regimes must be placed against a continuum as far as democracies uh, are concerned. <laughs> and I end by a quote from Robert Dahl, who is the forefather of democracy. For the story of democracy is as much a record of failure as of successes, of failures to transcend existing limits, of momentary breakthroughs followed by massive defeats, and sometimes of utopian ambitions followed by the disillusionment and despair. Measured against its exacting ideal, the imperfections of any actual democracy are so obvious and so enormous that the palpable discrepancy between the ideal and reality constantly stimulates unbounded hopes that the ideal may somehow be made real. Arabs have made their choice. They are determined to construct a better world it probably won't be a replica of a Western-style liberal democracy, but the, if the West can live with such a vision, great partnerships can be forged. It may take five or 10 years, but the Arab people will rise again. There is no going back. The wall of fear is broken. Democracy in the Arab world is not a mirage. The path to democracy may be tenuous and thorny. Nonetheless, homegrown Arab democracy will eventually prevail. The Arab peoples are ready for change. Can the global community accept that? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dan? Oh, thank you very much, Hale. I'm delighted to be here. I have been uh, cooperating with Hale now on Sorry. many programs for, what, a decade now or something like that? Yeah. And it's always nice to come back to the Wilson Center and uh, participate in activities. Um, I, I think a lot has been said, and we want to leave enough time for discussion, so I'm going to make my comments pretty, pretty quick. Um, no, you have, uh, uh, it, you have your 15 minutes, uh, but <laughs> <laughs> take your time. Well, as a, as a Democrat, I also want the masses <laughs> to participate. Um, Such an um, example. We're sitting here with the masses <laughs> in the case there is a revolt against. Um, the, uh, it was said quite, uh, quite correctly that uh, one, th one fact that the uh, Arab awakening demonstrates is that this wall of fear between states, regimes, despots, and populations has definitely been broken. And uh, I think that is absolutely the case. I think that the bigger question that is, is, is um, that has to be asked now in the wake of all these changes is whether the wall of fear within the walls, the various walls of fear within the societies have been broken. Yeah. And I think that's not the case. There are really two elements uh, in any process of uh, transition. There's the question of whether 
the state and the components of the state will hang on to power and whether there are elements within the state, we refer to them in our business as the soft liners, uh, are willing to negotiate with the opposition. Uh, in the context of a state and a regime that is uh, determined to stay on, in the context in the, of, a, uh, of a, uh, uh, in a situation where there are really no very significant splits uh, within the regime itself, um, a determined state can hold on to power for an awful long time, even when it's lost uh, legitimacy. And certainly the Egyptian state lost legitimacy to the regime long time ago before this revolt uh, took place. Um, I think the primary obstacle in the case of Egypt uh, has been the military. And when we talk about the military, we're talking not about a small apparatus, but when you total up the security and military apparatus, five, six hundred thousand plus families, those are millions of people whose interests are closely attached to a defending. Uh, and what has to be said, you can't simply dismantle a military overnight. I mean, these are people with families and livelihoods. They have legitimate interests, and they are very active in defending those interests. And uh, in the case of uh, Egypt, the downfall of Mubarak did not suggest, uh, nor the support that the military gave for that, in effect, that downfall, does not suggest the, uh, the emergence within the military of an influential group of soft liners who are really willing to negotiate with the opposition. This is a military that is united in its conviction and desire to, um, to survive. And I think that's the, that, in many respects, is the primary obstacle. In the case of uh, Tunisia, of course, the military was never politicized, didn't have the kinds of deep interests that the Egyptian military had, and stepped aside. Uh, this left the security apparatus to fight the battle, but the security apparatus wasn't willing to do it either. And so once the military stepped aside, uh, the second part of the equation, which is the society, stepped in. And the contrast between Egypt and Tunisia is telling, because in the case of Tunisia, ultimately the various factions which constituted the opposition had nowhere to go except to themselves. Mm -hmm. There wasn't an arbiter. In the case of Egypt, the military is not an arbiter. I mean, it pretended to be so, but it clearly wasn't an arbiter. But but it certainly was very effective in manipulating the tensions within the opposition. In the case of Tunisia, ultimately there wasn't any apparatus. And not only was not, there was no apparatus to manipulate those tensions, uh, but uh, there had been an effort several years before um, the, uh, the first a Arab revolt that we're talking about now started in Tunisia. There had been an effort several years before of Islamists and non-Islamists to hammer out a political pact among themselves. Uh, Al Stepan talks about this in his work. We, we know, that those who pursued work on Tunisia know that this effort to, at, bid, at, at building bridges was very important and was renewed, uh, again, in the absence of a military willing to manipulate those fears. So right. really, they've had to work it out themselves. And uh, while the rise of Salafists in uh, Tunisia has certainly posed a huge challenge, here is Ghanoushi in the Nakhda party uh, basically com compelled to, to clamp down on an Islamist opposition. The, the irony is telling, isn't it? Uh, but nevertheless, uh, you have a, a government, a cabinet, a, a troika of Islamists and non-Islamists. I prefer the term non-Islamist to secularist because I think the term secularist is misleading in, in the context we're talking about. Um, that has really, and what has that alliance done? It's essentially tried to overcome the walls of fear within the opposition that I was talking about before. Um, now, that has not, those walls are very significant because in the case of uh, Tunisia, it's not really a question of Islam and democracy. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a Sunni Muslim country, um, uh, no real minority, very small Jewish minority, but it's culturally, you could say religiously, not culturally, certainly united, but ideologically very divided. <laughs> divided in terms of is Tunisia part of Mediterranean, Europe, do we speak French, do we speak Arabic? Um, it's a civilizational divide uh, that isn't necessarily a, a, simply a question of the so-called uh, reinterpretation of Islam for democracy and so on. It's a much deeper sort of division. But nevertheless, what's remarkable is the readiness of Anushi and the Nakhda party to sort of really uh, address that division. Uh, and the transformation that took place within the Nakhda party in the last decade, in part because many of its leaders were overseas and they sat down, and I've interviewed many of them, and 
it's quite remarkable the sort of transformation, the rethinking that went through. They've come back and now they're wrestling with this, this increasingly um, violent Salafist movement, which is really, in the case of Tunisia, a jihadist movement. Uh, it's different from the Salafists in, in many respects. They, they, they're, they're ideologically closer to Al-Qaeda in so many ways. They're, they're so much of what you hear from the Salafists in, in Tunisia is a kind of radical agenda that uh, goes beyond the kind of initially apoliticism of the Salafists in Egypt. They're somewhat different sort of uh, movement. But in any case, uh, it's, it's there the wall of fear is reemerging re in part because of the Salafists and the, now the reemergence of polarization between uh, the Islamists and the non-Islamists. We've all read about this. Um, but nevertheless, my, I'm quite optimistic. And this is the contrast with the case of Egypt. In the case of Egypt, um, apart from the obvious challenge of the military, are the deep divisions within the opposition that have operated from the very beginning. I mean, if you can imagine uh, a, a day or two before the latest constitutional de declaration from the uh, e Egyptian authorities, the, uh, the members of parliament were still debating how to create a constituent assembly. <laughs> and it just met the other day, but there was a major boycott when it met. Um, the, the, there's no doubt that the non-Islamists fear the consequences of an Islamist majority imposing their uh, agenda on them. And uh, there's no doubt that I think Morsi and Muslim Brethren have not done a terribly good job of addressing those fears. Often the kinds of um, lessons one draws from experience come a little too late. But I think the lessons will be learned and I think that the prospects, in part because of the tenacity of the military, the prospects for the opposition making a better effort to overcome its own fears will be, will, will be, will be seen now. And again, it may be a little too late. <laughs> but that's why I'm, op I'm optimistic, because I think there's a learning process here. And ultimately, the learning process, is, and we've talked about Egypt, and we've talked about Tunisia, but in all the cases of the of transition, or so-called transition in the Arab world, this problem of national identity and of building political and ideological bridges and establishing a set of rules it's not just a matter of pact making between regimes and oppositions. It's a process of pact making and accommodating within oppositions. And if you look at Libya, if you look at God knows Yemen uh, and, and, and Syria too, of course, in a different sort of way, we can get into the details. This problem is very significant, yeah. um, and um, it's not going to be solved overnight. It's going to take a long time. That's why I think democratization, in this sense, the transition is a ten or twenty year process in the region. It's not going to happen overnight. But I want to conclude by saying the following. Um, uh, to go back to the military. In the case of Egypt, it, look, it's bizarre. I mean, the notion that you could have a constitutional court he, whose head was appointed by the, the, the president who was forced to resign, <laughs> a constitutional court that was essentially a wing of the regime, making the rules, <laughs> uh, is, in, in, for, for those of us who've done comparative studies of democratization transitions, just in many respects unprecedented. Um, because in, in, the, in the classic transition process, you put those old institutions aside. Yes, you'll have the military, but the notion that the courts would be mobilized and the Supreme Court, the high constitutional court, uh, by an, a former ally of the regime to come up with a set of decisions, you can talk about their legality in a certain context. But in the context of a transition, the, the legality of such decisions is completely up for, up for grabs. It's in many respects illegitimate because it should be the elected leaders who are defining the new rules of the game, and not the old institutions of the state. Mm. Uh, and so you can talk about w whether, you can talk about the current struggle between uh, 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 Shafiq and Morsi over who won this election, but if the election appears illegitimate in the eyes of many Egyptians, it's precisely because the steps that were taken prior to the election created a context in which the entire legitimacy of the election is now uh, up for grabs. So once again, uh, while the challenge of oppositions is to find some basic consensus, and that hasn't happened in so many cases, um, the, the real instigator and manipulator of this, pr of this uh, manipulator of these walls of fears in the case of Egypt is the, is the military. Um, and it's this, it's this very corrosive dynamic uh, that I think is hampering the process of democratization. But nevertheless, I do, I, I, I do feel, I mean, we've, we've crossed a, a historical threshold. And we are now in a process. When I was a student many years ago in Cairo University in the political science department, they used to say that Egypt was in a marhala intikalia, a transitional, transitional phase. We used to say mustamira, continuous, endless. Because where nobody went, this was in 87. You know, this was, Egypt was in transition then. You know, and, and the military would like to 
uh, like to say that we are still in a transition. They reminded us, that, yeah, we're on the way to democracy. Um, uh, <laughs> and one is tempted to, to ask the question, is this just a renewal of the old game we've seen in Egypt? Um, but I don't think so, because we've, we've cro crossed a threshold. But in terms of the learning process, there's a lot more to be done, and we can get into the details uh, as we discuss it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dan, let me start with you uh, posing a question. Uh, Latin America, some countries in Latin America, succeeded with this transition from authoritarianism to democracy in a much shorter period. I mean, why that success? Well, if we look at some Central Asian country, Although we had demonstrations, we had the colored revolution, uh, nothing happened, basically. Continues to be an authoritarian system. Can you, uh, just because you are a student of comparative. Right, you know? right. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a great question that we'll have to have an entire conference, Halid, about <laughs> Next this. Next time, uh, uh, but at what least we, what, did uh, we. What a colleague of mine called a Washington, D.C. Yeah. conference building measures. <laughs> uh, we'll have to uh, pursue that, um, uh, which is a hobby in, in Washington, as we all know. Um, you know, it, in the case of, first of all, in some cases of Latin America, it took a long time. I mean, the Brazilian transition, depending on when you date it, started '74 with the opening, mm -hmm. and sort of didn't really come to fruition until the early '80s. And some people would question whether, you know, it did. And it's, it's still going through a certain kind of transition. The Mexicans used to complain, had the same complaint as the Egyptians. When is this going to end? I mean, did the Mexican transition start in 1933? I mean, whatever. I mean, it's, so it's not as if these things happen overnight. I think the difference is not so much in the pace, but in this process of pact making that I was alluding to before. That is, in, in the case of Latin America, and the whole transitions theory that we academics use is based on this assumption, what divided opposition from the state was the struggle over the economic spoils and political spoils of power. Um, but it wasn't about whether Venezuela is going to be a Catholic state or this state or that state. There wasn't the kind of existential divide that we, what we see uh, in, in, in so many uh, uh, countries, in Central Asia as well, in, in the Middle East, uh, really f from the point of view of the potential losers in an election magnifies the, the threat of an election. And, and in which you could lose. And therefore, the temptation to go, I mean, autocracy is a protection racket in which the regime offers certain kinds of protections to groups that under conditions of democratization would, might lose. So in the case of the Middle East, uh, there is a real, uh, the, the liberals give tacit support to democracy. Many of them have done so for a long time. And I was on Al Hura television for two hours the other night with a number of, of colleagues and friends, including uh, a friend of mine from, from Georgetown University, Samer Shahata, and there was a fellow from the WAF party, essentially, in Egypt, uh, condoning the military's intervention. Uh, really, making excuses, because suddenly they were bandwagoning back to the old, old, old protection racket. So I think that's really, in many respects, you know, this is the kind of legacy of post-colonialism, that these issues of identity. I don't want to get into an issue, a debate about is Islam compatible or not. I mean, there are very, that's for people in the region to work out. But, but one, what one can say is that these, these differences are very deep, and they've really inhibited, because we know that militaries, for the most part, Tunisia's may be exceptional. Tun militaries hold on to power, and you have to make deals with them. In the case of Chile, they, they gave the militaries permanent seats in the Senate. Mm. You have to find ways to disengage the military from politics, and usually you pay them off in some way. And that kind of pact, I think, is unavoidable in the case of Egypt. There will have to be some negotiation. But if you can't negotiate, if one of the players, in this case a Muslim brethren, is constantly tempted to you know, play the card of the military, at the same time the liberals, for their own reasons, were also tempted. In the beginning, the military was exceptionally adept at playing at the, at the, at the, the fears and concerns and desires of all these players. They've got to overcome that, that, that. It's up to them to overcome that. We know what the military will do. The question is, what will the opposition Roberto, do you want to add something? Yeah, well, I think uh, before somebody quoted the Arab Human Development Report, right? I think there you find some of the reasons why transitions are more difficult. It's not only about the political system. It's about something that the political system established in terms of society. Um, 
Uh, for instance, culture in Latin America has never been as uh, suspect mm. as it was on the part of the non-democratic rulers in the Middle East. Culture, even non-democratic rulers in Latin America promote culture. They try to control it, of course. So this is one aspect. Women, women in Latin America have problems more in the family than in the state. And in, public, in the public sphere, you don't find many handicaps for Latin American women. The family, that's another story. Well, uh, the other story, is, it's, uh, which proves it's not about Islam, patriarchalism has found different rationale in different cultures. And uh, the, the prophets tended not to be women, and therefore uh, the, their rules uh, did not exactly favor women. Anyway, but that's another story. Ms. Sheila, do you want to add something? Well, if you are talking about <laughs> the difference between Latin America and the Middle East, uh, of course, this question was floating uh, before the Arab Spring started. Why this wave of democratization has skipped this region? Will it skip it forever? I would look at illiteracy. I would look at a culture that really instills apathy. Uh, it, there was no activism, either political activism or women activism, uh, always timid, always shy. Uh, and this patriarch, I can never pronounce this word right, but it, it basically attacks women, yeah. not democracy. <coughs> democracy is not there because people are uh, uh, indifferent, they are not educated, and they have different priorities. But I think it has changed now. And even what you said about the military is no longer as strong as it used to be. Uh, remember, the military had put the date end of the year, and then the, the masses in the square pushed, and then it went to June. And now we have elections, and the, the pushed back. Yeah. it's pushed back so by the masses. That's why I say the beauty of the uh, uh, Egyptian uh, revolution and the Tunisian revolution, they are self-made mm. by the people. Mm. They are made at home without any foreign intervention. Mm. So people realize now their power, and they will not accept it. They went to the square, millions now, not because of the presidential elections, but because of the recent constitutional declaration. And there was reports that the military had appointed a chief chamberlain. This was retracted. And there was another announcement by the military that the new president will resume office or will be uh, uh, sworn in with full mandate. So <coughs> you have the original constitutional declaration and the the contest now is with the new amendment which i think maybe we will not be surprised to see it retracted a few days from now especially that nobody really knows the content we haven't seen it in black and white and maybe this was a test balloon to see mm -hmm. how the people will react so i am i am very optimistic mm -hmm. that the people have made their stand uh, clear. What's also interesting is to, you write about the division between the opposition, but it's also interesting to watch the language used by the liberals or the non-Islamists right after the revolution. They said, no, we're not worried about political Islam. They are our brothers. We're all together. Now, the concern is very, very high. Yes, indeed. Very, very high. And the proof is the decline in the number of votes that political Islam uh, gets. And Sheikh, the prime minister of uh, the, the former prime minister, is on par now between uh, uh, 51 uh, Morsi and uh, 48 Shafiq. Some people say Shafiq is leading. And this tells you the, the, the shift in the masses. The masses started to see. Uh, the, the, the worry in the language, in the performance of political Islam, and they want to make things right. And also something very interesting to watch, the softening of the language of the Salafis, of the Muslim Brotherhood, mm. under pressure from the liberals, despite the fact that the liberals are the minority, they're divided, they don't have 
as much popular support as the, the, the Islamists. So I am optimistic that maybe, maybe we will not see the scenario of Iran because yeah. the liberals will have the masses behind them. And this may, because what happens in Egypt sets the tone for the entire region. And uh, you should look at the region in its totality, its political Islam rising, it's an Islamic spring. This is very uh, obvious. But the people, and, and, and that's why people are, will be impatient with the military as they have been impatient with the Islamists. Five months in the parliament or six months in the parliament and they've lost a lot of credibility because they focused on <coughs> they didn't really represent the revolution, though they claim that they represent the revolution. You could see on television, uh, local television, uh, the use of the, of the revolution saying, well, uh, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, the Salafis do not represent the revolution. They were not with us when we went down to the street at the beginning. And these were the most crucial mm. days. So, Maybe the traditional moderate face of Egypt will be preserved, we hope. We should remember that in the case of Iran, when millions of people came out and uh, asked for the abolition of the monarchy, the slogan was independence, freedom, Islamic republic. Yeah. So, so we should, while in none of the Arab countries, this sentence of Islamic Republic or Islam was part of the demand of the people. Definitely. And the first referendum, which gave the choice between the Islamic and Islamic Republic or the old regime, a majority, I mean, let's say over 90% of the people, without knowing what an Islamic Republic <coughs> entailed, voted for an Islamic Republic. Mm, mm. And then, over the last three decades, they were facing with the realities. And in 2009, when people came out into the street, they were protesting the rigging of the elections. They just asked, where is my vote? Neither the opposition leader nor the people wanted a fundamental change of regime. It happened maybe over the 10 days that the protest movement uh, lasted. And after they saw the clampdown of the demonstrators, the atrocities that one heard were committed. So I think this is also a very big difference between Iran. But then there is also the problem of a constitution. I mean, the problem in Iran is that the Islamic Republic doesn't even adhere to its own constitution. If they did, at least to that, no matter how limited the freedom is in that constitution, they do not adhere to that. Fatima, any comment on what? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree with all what uh, my colleagues have said. Uh, I have a uh, few additions of differences between what's going on and what has gone on in Latin America or in other countries. The important thing is political parties that are missing mm -hmm. in this part of mm -hmm. the world. And political parties are the ones that uh, get the interests together. And even if they exist, they are either sectarian or they are they're, uh, they're, uh, uh, ad address one uh, group of people. So this is one thing. The, the political institutions are not solid. They are not long standing in, in uh, political terms. And the... Um, there's another difference which is important and has been studied. What path democracy takes? Do, does it take after the, the uprisings? Uh, do they go through parliamentary or presidential uh, system or a constitutional system? These differences are still uh, very apparent between the, the Latin American experience and our experience and the Arab experience. And then the other thing is we don't have a strong civil society. And this is the, the part of the, what we call the social cleavages, that it breaks, as, as, as Dan has said, it breaks the society. There are, uh, you know, you look at the society and you see in each country, you know, their, their, uh, their social cleavages are conflict producing. So this is another 
uh, problem that needs to be addressed and makes a difference. The culture, as, as, uh, as we said, is not a problem in the, in, uh, in, in the Arab countries, they often conflate political culture with religion. And you don't know if FGM is, is mandated in the, uh, in the Quran or it's, it's tradition. You see, this is, these are the, the, the basic issues. Um, we are opening the floor to, uh, to you, Ma, and then, yeah. Just wait for the mic and identify yourself. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Mark Katz from George Mason University. Uh, we heard about a comparison of uh, the Arab Spring with Latin America. I'd like to ask if there is a possible comparison with Russia. You know, uh, with the downfall of the Soviet Union, there was tremendous hope. The liberals seem to be, you know, uh, in the forefront of this, very strong. But from the very beginning, the liberals fell out with one another, uh, failed to cohere in the 1990s, allowing for the return of the conservatives. And despite everything that's happened, this is still the case uh, that maybe what we've seen this past, you know, fall, you know, is uh, starting to be a rebound. But it's been a long, long time. Therefore, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit surprised about the, the confidence that, that some of the speakers have indicated about the possibility that the uh, liberals in the Arab world are somehow, despite everything that's happened, going to get back together and play a leadership role. When we've seen an example in Russia where we're still waiting for this to happen, uh, your comments would be welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto. Well, I, 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 I don't share that confidence. Uh, and uh, Russia, uh, indeed, is a case in point. It, I mentioned the imitation democracy because this is something that we see in Russia. But probably we, will, we see it also in other places. For instance, let's take Turkey. In many ways, throughout the Arab world, they look at Turkey as a positive example. Mm. And I don't think, as uh, uh, Turkish secularists uh, uh, fear, that next year it will be like Iran. But next year it might be like Russia, in the sense that Erdogan is authoritarian. Uh, it's not that he's going to impose religion, but he's going to be a strong state. Now, this is what's happening in Russia. Given the fact that the uh, humiliation of not no longer being a superpower, uh, the disarray of a transition to a, a market economy with uh, winners and losers, uh, the old uh, Russian tradition of the strong state and of the strong leader of the state has come back. This has no comparison with Ar the Arab world. I think the Arab world has the opposite uh, problem of the weak state, and within the weak state, only the military sometimes are an element of strength. Mm -hmm. But the state is such, it, it, it's not, it's what, you know, uh, the concept of the asabiya, they, you have your own identification with your own group, which is, can be religious or local. Or, so in Russia, uh, the strong state is the main enemy of a transition to democracy. I think in the Arab world, the lack of non-sectarian identification as citizens with a state is the problem. So maybe the, f the, the parallels can converge as far as results, but the reasons are opposite. Mm. Then you want to well, I mean, the, you know, also there's the, which we haven't touched on much, is this the whole question of crony capitalism and the way in which, you know, these, these regimes have manipulated the so-called process of market reform, which has played into the fears of uh, lots of groups about what how the relationship between capitalism and market reforms and democracy. And, and of course, we see these fears being exploited by Putin. And we see these fears being exploited by the regime in Egypt. Uh, of course, from the point of view of the military, the kinds of economic reforms that were undertaken by Mubarak and his sons and his cronies were eating into their own economic base. And they had reasons to get rid of this particular problem. And, um, and therefore, they probably didn't, in some respects, shed a lot of tears as a result of what had happened because they had their own economic agenda and it was very much attached to a, a kind of rentier cronyism of its own. But I think the, the problem of, of sort of how you pursue market reforms and the way in which this feeds into uh, a, a kind of economic process which disillusions large sections of the population with the prospects of capitalism really feed into the manipulation of these sorts of, by these sorts of regimes and these sorts of despots. 
Um, for Can those I? of, yes, mm -hmm. just one minute. For those of you who would like to find out what really happened under the previous regime, referring in Egypt, referring to the points that Dan made, we'd ask you to read a publication the Middle East program did called Egypt at the Tipping Point by our colleague David mm -hmm. Otway, who uh, more or less predicted yes. everything. Um, you want to add yes, something? Yes, yes, I wanted then we'll uh, the, why the confidence that the liber uh, about the liberals being uh, strong and the scenario Russia and everything, we have to take the time factor. Today is not the same like uh, uh, two or three decades before. T today, the liberals have more tools to become strong, and they have more energy to challenge. And the history with the Muslim Brotherhood, if you go to the history of political Islam in Egypt and how uh, the Muslim Brotherhood identified themselves or sent the messages through certain assassinations, uh, uh, cr across the Egyptian history, I think we have all reasons to be confident that the liberals will be stronger and more united than they are now. Don't forget that the revolution without leaderless. Mm. It was leaderless. It yeah. was without a leader. And they were caught by surprise. The liberal parties <coughs> were very fragmented and the only group that could work freely was the Muslim Brotherhood. So they had a very strong machinery. When the revolution happened, they were easily uh, uh, grouped and uh, got into business, and the same in the uh, elections. Uh, economy, I think, is the real problem in Egypt now and will be the real challenge. Uh, the uh, revolution and demolishing the wall of fear has taken with it the discipline to work. And now the, uh, the transitional uh, government, uh, the government of Isam Sharaf took disastrous economic decisions under the pressure from Tahrir Square and the parliament took disastrous economic pressures under the pressure of Tahrir Square. Now, how will you sort out the problem of the subsidies? How will you improve the productivity? What kind of economic stimulus will you use to abolish unemployment or at least remove unemployment? Because unless you make strong uh, progress on the economic front, the revolution will fail. Mm. Uh, yes, in the back. Yeah. My name is Ahmed. I would like to ask about Saudi Arabia. A lot of people think that Saudi Arabia has played a counter-revolutionary role. It has uh, given extremely generous aid packages to its population to subdue them. It has crushed the rebellion in Bahrain and now um, is actively <coughs> funding a lot of the Free Syrian Army in Syria, trying to prevent um, a lot of uh, reform in Morocco and Jordan and uh, supporting Hariri in Lebanon. Do you envision uh, Saudi Arabia as hijacking a lot of the um, revolutionary spirit in the Arab world? And you envision Iran uh, uh, trying to repel some of the anti-revolution of, of the ruling family of Saudi Arabia? One of the panelists should take this question. Well, I, I, you know, I think in the case of Bahrain, it's obvious that the, you know, the, for the, the, the Saudi involvement. Was, I think in the case of Bahrain, it's, it's obvious that Saudi has been instrumental in making sure that, but I think it's easy to exaggerate the, uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, Saudi, the Saudi influence as well. I think um, the Middle East program, again, uh, I have to repeat, did uh, an article, you can read it on Saudi Arabia, it's on our website, again, by David Arthaway. <laughs> so I refer you to that. And there is, we have another article on our website by uh, Carol Murphy, a public policy scholar at the center, who did one on the Saudi youth and tackled some of these uh, issues. Do you want to yeah, add Yeah, I just something? wanted to add that, you know, the intervention of Saudi Arabia in Bahrain is part of an agreement. They have the, the, the Gulf Cooperation Council agreement to, to, to uh, support each other in, uh, uh, in case of military or civil conflict. So they, by that onus, you know, 
they went in and helped. Yeah. But uh, the other issues that you raised are too political to get into in, in uh, two minutes. No, I mean, right. the, 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 uh, this is what, what I call the foreign intervention, whether it's foreign or Western. It is intervention in, in uh, the, the, you know, domestic affairs. Yeah. Um, yes, please. I, I just move from one side to the other side, and then so everybody gets their chance. Yes. Thank you very much um, for your perspectives. Um, I haven't heard um, the recent constitutional amendment been mentioned very much. I was wondering if you thought um, the recent SCAF um, amendment that allows it to pass legislation um, and to have a permanent say in Egyptian politics, if this was a game changer. Um, certainly a lot of Egyptians have flocked to Tahrir Square as mentioned about this, um, or is this more of the same? Thank you. I haven't, I haven't read them. I cannot comment on them. Uh, there were reports that the, the, with the dissolution of the parliament, uh, the SCAF has taken the uh, legislative uh, powers. We've read that the new president will be sworn in before SCAF, and then it was announced that it will be sworn in before the, the uh, uh, head of the constitutional court. I cannot really uh, comment on the new additional constitutional amendments as I have not seen them. Mm -hmm. But I know that people are in Tahrir Square to ask what are these constitutional amendments and to express their concern, which means that still there are question marks about the content. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's why I said it may be a test balloon. I don't know. Yeah, to yeah. a certain advantage to ambiguity, I suppose. What I've seen in terms of the amendments, the, the thing, I, it's not strange, or it's in fact entirely predictable that the military would try to carve out certain guarantees in terms of control of the Ministry of Defense and so on. What I found disconcerting were the two amendments relating to Article 60 of the current Constitution of Egypt, whatever constitution that is. It's you know, the three or four constitutions that seem to be in operating and at, at, at the making it at once. Uh, that would give the uh, SCAF the capacity, in effect, to basically override the decisions of the Constituent Assembly if any of those decisions mm. were remotely unacceptable to the SCAF. Uh, and I think that's, that's for me, the, the provisions that are, you know, if they turn out to be true, uh, that are really could poison the well. Because uh, unless you can have a credible Constituent Assembly that uh, makes decisions and arrives at consensus, uh, about the parameters, and decisions may include some concessions to the military. This probably would be necessary, but unless they do this independently and cannot have their voice constantly overridden by the SCAF, it, it really suggests uh, that the, we're in for a very difficult ride in the immediate future. And the lady, the, yes, uh, yes, yes, you. <laughs> Iman Salah. Um, I have a question. Can you speak a bit louder? Iman Salah. Um, I have a question more directed to Ms. Fatima Gassim. Um, you talked about political parties, and since we talked a little bit about Syria and how a lot of people assume it's either civil war or genocide happening, happening in Syria, but a lot of people are concerned that what's going on, the conflict in Syria, is spilling over to Lebanon, and how in Lebanon there's about 17 political parties that all address to religious political groups. Do you think that could be a conflict of other countries that kind of implement these political parties in the government by addressing it to religious groups? Or do you think that would help the population within Arab countries? Uh, uh, this is a one million dollar question, you know. <laughs> um, political parties play an important role, but they have in, in uh, <coughs> in political reform, let's put it that way, if that exists. But your one of uh, part of your question is whether the uh, events in Syria will spill over in, uh, into mm -hmm. Lebanon. This is a, a direct threat. I mean, all of us are aware that this could happen. They're trying, the government in uh, Lebanon is trying to contain this in more ways than one. But you know there is the opposition in, in Lebanon and the opposition mi might be supporting the uh, opposition in uh, Syria. This is the, what they're claiming and, and it's in the open. So uh, this cannot be uh, contained. 
and uh, political parties are r with varying religiosities in uh, Lebanon are transforming and they see eye to eye with the events and they don't want any more civil war in Lebanon. You know, Lebanon has had, according to the Lebanese, has had its share of wars 15 years is more than enough. So uh, as we say in, in, uh, uh, in Egypt, Rabbina <laughs> Yustur. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm uh, Jamil Batayib, uh, human rights and labor activist from Tunisia. Uh, I really have no question, but uh, I want to just... Uh, no, no, just questions, please. Uh, I sorry. would like to speak a little bit about uh, Tunisia. Yeah, I'm sorry. No problem. Uh, so sorry. Just uh, a question. Barbara, here and then here. Yes. And then you wait. Barbara Slavin from the Atlantic Council and almonitor.com. Um, just, Moshe, if, if, you, if I could follow up a little bit, you talked about the economy and how important it is. What should the United States and other countries, Western countries, be doing to help shore up the economy? And there's, there's the question of military aid, the $1.3 billion that the U.S. gives every year, and some concern that, you know, this is a blank check, uh, suggestions that it, it should not be given, that it should be given to the military. Would you use that as leverage to try to make sure that that the military does not monopolize and take over from uh, the revolution. Okay. Thank, Thank you very Thank you. much, uh, Barbara. This is a very important a question. question. Yeah. And uh, it's interestingly enough, there were calls in Egypt to put an end to American aid. They said, we don't want aid from the United States. It's a long story about the system of the aid, how you provide aid. Uh, I can speak about the aid that goes to NGOs and to human issues, it needs to be restructured. A lot of money goes into administrative issues and it goes to the contractor. And what ends up with the beneficiaries is peanuts. So there was really a call to put an end to this aid and focus on trade, not aid. So if you encourage exports to be uh, competitive. There is a lot of uh, problems on, on encouraging exports. Investing in education. Education in Egypt is the thing that will make it or break it for the population. All the assets are human assets in Egypt and the biggest uh, drain is in education. The money spent on education does not bring any return because the quality of education is miserable. Mm. And that's what really why I like what Thomas Friedman wrote on the 18th of June. Rot learning, no life skills in schools. Uh, you have to reform education. And I have followed some, I, I'm working in the field. I have followed some uh, uh, programs. This piloting, you know, to make a pilot project on a small number of, of, of people in a remote locality and then write a magnificent report and make a very elegant publication is not the solution. Make sure that you have a system that applies to all. Uh, improve the infrastructure, teacher training, uh, allow critical thinking. This is crucial. Improve because the, the, the increase in number of students every year in schools make the class sometimes 100, 120, and the teacher is not trained, no. So invest in education, but with a vision, because currently there is no vision, neither before the revolution nor after the revolution. And education has never been a priority. You don't l give it lip service, but really improve the quality of education. This is the, the, the best investment with the highest return in economic terms. And we are going, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. we are going uh, to take two last questions together because we have four minutes and then we'll stop. Brief questions, yes, please. And then the lady right behind it. Yeah. My name is uh, Gregory Galgan. I'm with the Department please. of State. Um, the panelists, I think, have spoken with some positive, and, uh, positive views about the future of Tunisia and Egypt. But no one has mentioned Libya. And Libyan elections are in two weeks. And when I look at Libya, I see certain advantages economically in terms of population homogeneity, but also key deficiencies with respect to institutions. I was wondering what the panelists thought about the future of Libyan democracy 
And if they thought that this was the time to move forward with elections before institutions were in place. And the lady behind you, and then uh, Roberto, you take mm -hmm. this question. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. I had a question uh, really to all the panelists in terms of culture and cultural politics in the region. And if um, you could probably discuss how, how there is a movement toward freedom of expression in that regard from an institutional standpoint. I'm only familiar with Egypt and the Ministry of Culture during um, being you know, initiated the, during the Nasser age and then, and then how it was very controlled under the other presidents. So I was wondering if you could address okay. that. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you. Well, uh, before Latin America was mentioned, so let's take the best case of transition, Chile. I, and let's take the ingredients. First, a previous experience of democracy. Second, rule of law. Third, strong civil society. Fourth, uh, political parties. Well, if you go to Libya, maybe you see the countries at the opposite end. So it's going to That's be so extremely, extremely yeah. difficult. Uh, uh, also because some dictatorships have built some sort of state and civil society under control, but not the Libyan case. It was really the most uh, backward in many ways. So it's going to be very difficult to uh, counteract, well, you see the militias now, and you see the regionalism. The, the, it's going to be extremely, extremely difficult. And from the outside, I really don't know, because uh, 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 yes, the economy is going to be important, but oil can be a curse, as we know, because it's, it allows any government to, uh, to be not a democratic government, but uh, somebody distributing privilege. Uh, and we see it also in other situations like Iran and so on and so forth. Dan? Well, I mean, it seems to me in the case of Libya and to some extent Yemen, the process, state collapse that is not followed by building of strong institutions a and then the holy of, demo uh, of elections can be a, a pretty lethal combination. So one, one has to be uh, cautious uh, at the very least. And, I, and the, I'm, out, I'm no expert on Libya, but the, the, it's very hard once you have mo uh, militias that are mobilized Mm. to sort of bring them under control and under the uh, umbrella of the state. And the longer that goes on, the worse it becomes. And I think the region demonstrates that. Fatima, you have to no, I have two, po two points. Mm -hmm. uh, the one thing is that th yeah. in Libya and, and in Yemen, they have, true, they don't have political, uh, they don't have institutions in place. That's very true. But maybe the civil society is working very strongly in Libya, which gives us more hope. And in Yemen, there's a tradition. They have a, a civil society. Uh, at least in, in, uh, they have been working together. So this gives us a glimpse of hope. Thank you. Uh, civil society in Egypt, we have an old and big civil society with varying strength, very strong and very fragile and emerging. The problem always was between the state and the civil society, the relationship and the interference in the uh, civil society. I thank you very much for what you said about culture, though you said you know about Egypt. I want to tell you that right now, are artists in all kinds, writers, uh, journalists, uh, uh, actresses, uh, they all formed a united front facing the political Islam because they want to maintain freedom of expression and uh, artistic expression, which they, we have seen many alarming signs of uh, uh, calling some people atheists because they put a certain sentence in a, in a story or, or, or something like this. So now they constitute a very strong uh, lobby and they have taken a strong political stance. We should always remember that autocratic regimes feel very threatened by an, uh, by an active civil society. And that has been the case in Iran, <coughs> and I hope the recent development in Egypt is not a bad omen. <coughs> Please join me in thanking our panelists.